Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast from Altos Research. This is the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the trends shaping the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. For three years now, we've been sharing the latest market data every week in our weekly video series at Altos Research. With the Top of Mind podcast, we like to add context to the discussion about what's happening in the market from leaders in the industry. Every week, of course, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country, all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. People desperately need to know what's happening in the market right now. It was frozen so solid last year, and, and now you know the, the landscape changed dramatically this year again. So if you need to communicate about this market to your clients, go to altosresearch.com and book a free consult with our team. We can review your local market and how you use market data in your business. All right, let's get to the show today. I've got a terrific guest today, Adina Hefetz. Adina is the co-founder and CEO of Divi Homes, a prop tech company on a mission to make home ownership accessible to everyone. A noble goal. Uh, in 2017, Adina set out to solve a problem she saw in the market. Fewer people can afford to purchase a home now than two decades ago. Heck, even uh, two years ago. Uh, so she developed a new rent-to-own model that allows renters to gradually build up ownership in their future homes while living in it. So today, we're going to talk about prop tech. We're going to talk about affordable housing, financial models, and, and so much more about housing. So Adina, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So for our listeners uh, who don't know Divi Homes, let's start there. And let, tell us about, uh, about uh, Adina, uh, about, about Divi and, and how you, you came to start the company. Sure. Uh, so Mike, I founded Divi in 2017. Uh, and just kind of how you said it was uh, with the with the goal in mind of of how do I make home ownership more accessible? Um, and I thought, hey, there there's an entire group of Americans here. And at the time, it was something like um, a little bit lower, something like call it half to a little bit slightly over fifty percent of Americans could not actually access a mortgage. And I thought, how do I create something that thinks, feels, acts like home ownership? And then I thought, well, okay, if I can't give them a mortgage, what else can I give them? How else could I package this such that it actually seems like something that is interesting to capital markets, to investors? Because ultimately, I needed their capital to go actually be able to execute on this. And so I thought, hey, there's this thing called a single family rental portfolio that, that lots of investors do. How can I give people access to home ownership and marry that with the sort of the investor lens that looks like single family rental and create a product? So. I, um, I locked myself in my apartment. I pulled out an Excel spreadsheet, which is generally how I start solving most problems in my life, as my, my husband will say. Uh, and uh, I, I started thinking about what we could actually create. And um, about a week later, I came up with the idea of something called, uh, I'd say, a, a rent home that was a little bit more than a rent home. And it was a rent home where, and it still is to this day, where you can actually build savings in your rental property. So what did I want? I wanted so that consumers could pick out their own home because I thought that was really important. Um, I wanted so that they could start off with some initial savings in the house so that they were bought in to the property that they were thinking more like a homeowner. And then I wanted to give them the ability to actually build equity savings in a home over time. So that is exactly how Divi is structured today. Customer comes to our webpage. We underwrite them for a budget. They go out shopping. They pick out the home not Divi. It is not a preset inventory. It is they pick out the home. Divi buys it on their behalf. They contribute one to 2% of the home value as initial savings. They make one monthly payment, um, which is rent plus their option of how much they want to save every single month. Um, so you can decide one month, $20 a month, one month, $200 a month. It saves in the value of the home at that time and appreciates with them. And there's always a buyout right on the property at a preset price so they can roll their equity onto a mortgage or walk away and cash out their equity less a surrender fee. Um, so it really is, I think, an innovative way that that is really going to drive the future, the future of home ownership. So it's it is the, the payment works by you do a one or two percent down, you put a little bit down because that's of course mm -hmm. a huge hurdle for a lot of buyers is the down payment. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I build my equity over time with sort of like optional 
extra payments? Is that is that how it works? Yeah, it's like an interest only mortgage, but you have a savings app and you can decide I want to save up this much every this month and this much this month, or you can set in, forget it, and just say twenty dollars, two hundred dollars a month, whatever you want. Um, mm-hmm. And I actually think that that is why people ask me often, you know, is the end goal for someone to move on to a mortgage? And you know, when mortgages were at two to three percent for thirty year fixed, I was like, yes, that's the goal. That's the intellectually rational decision. You will not find a cheaper option out there. However, today, when mortgages are 6.7%, I look at them and I'm like, I'm not actually sure if that's the end goal because it's actually more expensive today to get a mortgage than it is to to rent with Divi. You, on top of having it with a mortgage, you have to pay maintenance, taxes, insurance. And by the way, when was the last time your mortgage provider said, hey, you can optionally choose to amortize your principal payment down or not, right? You're not given flexibility. You're not given optionality, right? And so I actually think that there's this break-even spot, which I've roughly calculated it at, is call it right around a 5% mortgage rate, where you should be ambivalent from just a pure financial economical perspective between Divi and and owning. And then it's really a question of, is, is there enough you know extras that make you want to pick one versus the other? And that's kind of for the consumer to decide. Okay, so yeah, so in, and this is actually s- sort of further down in the conversation, but but you know we are, we've shifted from the the free money world to the not free money world, and and like that has to have implications for everybody, including Divi as a company, and uh, for for your buyers, your customers. Completely, and I think that look, I think co- consumers are economically super rational. You know, they might not think, hey, what is my implied interest expense with Divi versus a mortgage, but they will say, hmm, what's my payment on a mortgage? And now you're telling me I have to pay PMI? And now I have to pay how much in taxes? And let me guess what I think maintenance is? And then I just got to quote for insurance. And they're like, and you're telling me I have to pay all of that? Yeah. Or I can go with Divi, I can pay this amount. And by the way, I have like an app that I could just like go through a chat function or put in a request when I have a maintenance thing and I never have to deal with it. Wait a second. Like the light bulbs go off. I think consumers actually really get this. And, um, you know, it's interesting, Mike, when I founded Divi in 2017, the interest rates were super low. I never thought this was going to be, that that was the hardest time. Meaning that was the hardest time to get consumers because my number one competition was mortgages, right? And it's only now that I think that mortgage rates have increased that I realize, hey, if we have this much consumer demand during record low interest rates, right? I'm so hopeful for the future. And I can see it in the numbers. I can see that our demand is still insanely strong, despite cutting back on on marketing dollars. I can see that demand has only increased for Divi over time. And I think that we're actually somewhat counter cyclical in that way, which is when rates start to increase, I actually think that Divi becomes more attractive. So I can imagine uh, the the counter cyclical uh, impact in that suddenly renting is more attractive. You and I both live in the Bay Area, and suddenly renting is significantly more attractive in many cases than than purchasing. Um, but it's also becoming true in, in a lot of the country uh, because mortgage rates are so much higher. Um, isn't that the case, though? Because most of the the properties that you're going to rent from are are financed with cheap money. So in other words, the like now when we go to buy a, a home, is, doesn't the rents get set higher now? Is that How is that working for your customers who are opting in now? Are yeah, they getting, so, like, do they get market rents? So there's a few different ways I, I probably, I would think about this. So first and foremost is what is market equilibrium? So market equilibrium, if you go back historically, rent is always set about 20% higher than than mortgages, than the cost of a mortgage. Why? Because if you're a landlord, you have to cover that mortgage cost and taxes and maintenance and insurance. So you set rent a little bit higher so you can be break even at least. That is most of the time about a 20% premium. Except the difference is Jerome Powell started raising the Fed funds rate and he did it so quickly that mortgage payments started to spike really quickly and rents don't move that quickly. 
you're in long-term contracts. You have a one-year rent contract. It's not like Jerome moves the Fed funds rate. And I'm like, hey, by the way, Mike, we're raising your rent now by 25 bips because that's what, when interest rates went up by, that's that's not how rent works. And so rent now is 25% cheaper than an apples to apples mortgage payment for the same home because it hasn't had time to catch up. So what is the impact on the industry? Yes, there is a world in which rents will increase over time to get back to that market equilibrium. There's also a world though where mortgage rates come back down, right? And that kind of brings the, the market back into equilibrium. I'm a big believer in extremes aren't the thing. You look at long-term historical averages and that is what is probably gonna happen over time. So I would say right now for the consumer, rent is economically cheaper. And that's not going to last forever. That is a, a moment in time when we have this dislocation because rates for mortgages go up really quickly and rents do not at the same pace. And so right now, renting should feel cheaper. And I bet it will equalize at some point in the future. Um, but for consumers now, that is the current market situation. Got it. So, um, and, and it's super powerful in that, um, you know, you think about the affordability challenges in the country, um, and the affordability to ownership uh, challenges, that is a, uh, like anybody who's studied the housing market at all in the U.S. realizes that, like, we have an affordability problem and we have an affordability problem for for everybody. Um, and, the, and so then um, tell me about, like, that journey of the, the, the Divi buyer. Like, how, how like, how many... How, you're in not all markets, right? So you're in you're in limited yeah. markets. We're in twenty markets. Mm -hmm. Twenty markets, okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I assume it's the inbound migration markets, the places where everybody wants to live, like like uh, the south and west. Are the, is that true, or are you are you working in other places that you find compelling? Our largest markets are the Texas, Florida, and Georgia markets, and we have a presence also a pretty decent sized footprint in the Midwest. In the Midwest. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, those are interesting because those have different rent and affordability characteristics. Like the, the Midwest markets have significantly more affordable purchase rates, purchase ability than, than even like Florida and Texas these days. So uh, how does that uh, impact your, your buyers? Yeah. So I would say, okay, taking a step back, what what has driven the affordability issue in the U.S.? Um, and if you look at it, it is not that it is not that rents are like astronomically taking off. The problem is, is that incomes have not kept up with the rate at which homes have appreciated. So homes, home prices in the U.S. have skyrocketed. Rents are just a percent of home prices, right? It just tracks the market because if you're a landlord, you have to take out a mortgage, which tracks the home prices, right? That is what it's tracking to. Um, so home prices have increased at a rate greater than income has increased in the U.S. Now, why is that the case that that income hasn't kept up with with home prices? Well, we fundamentally under underbuilt in the U.S., right? So if you think about supply and demand dynamics, everyone, everyone in the U.S., I don't care who you are, everyone dreams of owning a home, period, right? And we haven't built enough homes to support that. And we haven't done it systematically for 10 to 20 years. And what happened is during the financial crisis, because of a, a switch in supply and demand dynamics, there were a mass number of foreclosures, which, odd, which, which created a bit of a shock to the market and caused home prices to go down in a very unusual way versus historically how they've trended. And we finally started getting back to kind of historical norms of like, okay, let's start really building. Um, and then we had another shock to the system, which is COVID, right? Which brought forward a lot of demand that maybe wasn't going to come online until later. And if you think about during COVID, and I speak about this on some other podcasts, which I actually think is, it's, it's a tough point to make, which is that ultimately supply and demand didn't balance out correctly during COVID. Meaning there was significant demand. And during significant demand or times of that, you would have expected the market to balance out on the supply side. How would we have expected that? We would have expected government foreclosures. Unemployment spiked. People couldn't make their mortgage payments. We would have expected foreclosures. And I don't want to comment on the social issue because I'm actually very supportive of supporting uh, Americans during very challenging times. And so I think the right thing to do was to say, let's, let's figure out payment plans. But ultimately, the government meddled in the market in a way 
that didn't lead to a balanced economy within the housing market, right? It caused people to stay in homes that otherwise supply would have come online. And now we have this issue that just even got further exacerbated, which is as a result of that, we now have even fewer homes listed for sale um, than we had thought. And that's not fixing itself. So to me, like the U.S. has this fundamental problem where not enough homes, everyone wants a home, right? And that hasn't balanced itself out. And we've had two supply, two, two shocks throughout the system that have fundamentally altered the market in ways that maybe would have been unnatural otherwise. Um, so I don't know. I didn't really answer your question, but I'm, I'm more in support of it, which is like, I do think that we have an affordability crisis. I think the affordability crisis is due to home prices increasing at a faster rate than income can increase. Um, and I think we have to do something about it, right? I don't think the answer is, hey, by the way, don't ever dream of owning a home. I think that it is a time for innovation. You look for these points. You look for these moments where markets are dislocated in such a way where you get to create a product that actually serves demand. And that's what I see with Divi, is there's a dislocation in the market and we're, we're serving it. And by that, I, I like that a lot. The uh, yeah, the, all of the policy and the laws and the tax structure in the country is designed to favor the people that own homes and to keep them in their homes. And so, uh, it seems unlikely that those all of that policy is going to change anytime soon, right? So we end up with this case where we we encourage people to have their life savings in their home, uh, and therefore we we can't really allow home prices to decline. We can't really allow the, and, and therefore we have an affordability, a continual affordability crisis. Okay. So that makes sense to me that, that then there are, there are paths to uh, like Divi is creating to um, getting people into, for into uh, a home, a building equity um, and the, the low, uh, down payment requirement, one to two percent, and and then uh, building some equity over time. So that makes sense. So let's. I'm interested in the impact that you're having. So like, like how many people uh, are taking advantage of it, and is it um, like are, are you actually building significant equity in places? Like when the home price goes up, if I bought from Divi in 2017, do I get the upside? Who, who's gets that? How does that all work? Yeah, so our customers who had owned a home um, and then decided in 2021 or the first half of 2022 to, to buy back, they were significantly in the money. You know what? Good for them. Good for them. I want them to have that, right? That was the bet that they made. They got into a Divi home and we priced it assuming consistent. Generally, we you can see it all on our website. It's all public, but generally call it three, three and a half, four percent annual appreciation. So pretty mild. It depends. It's zip code levels. So everything is specific to a geo. I'm giving you broad averages across the US, which is never averages always kind of get you in trouble. So I apologize for that. But um uh, for for those folks where markets went up 20% year on year, they got all of that. And good for them. And look, it's not always going to work out in the consumer's favor. It balances out. And I probably say in this market right now, right, maybe people are going to have more more um, uh, or lower appreciation going forward, and they're not going to get as much of a benefit, but that's okay. I think that the bet here with consumers um, and the way that Divi thinks about like what success looks like is providing options. Like what I want to do fundamentally is my job is not to like arb the market for consumers so that they make like an amazing return because they happen to pick the right years. No, my goal with Divi is give people the option. Let them move into the house they want today. Let them have the availability of going to the school district that they want their kids to go to. Let them start to nest, settle down, create a home, right? Feel comfortable, feel stable. Give them the constant option to stay in that house. You can build equity in that house. It's your choice. Or you can choose not to. Like, you don't have to feel pressured one way or the other. And by the way, if you want to ever roll into a mortgage, if mortgage rates get to a point where you're excited about them and you want to, you have that option available to you as well. So I think my goal here is to create what I think is a more customizable, flexible homeownership program, one that I would want. I don't want to be, you know, right now, if you ask me, would I take on a mortgage at 6.7%? No. No, I would never do it. I wouldn't. Yeah. And, yeah. and look, it's not even high. Relative to historical mortgage rates, it's not that high. 
but I'm a zero baby. And so I'm used to like a good steady three to 4%. That's where I locked in my mortgage. And so if I had to move right now and give up that, I wouldn't do it. And I don't think I should ever ask anything of our customers that I myself wouldn't want. So, uh, yeah, for sure. And then, so you, they, the, you enter in an agreement with a, with a customer and then they go out and shop for the home. Is that right? Yes. Is yes. there a, is there like a buy box that you guys have that as ultimately you're, you're like a single family rental operator. You own a bunch of homes and you have tenants in them. You just have an extra equity incentive and maybe a, and a, and a, like a, a right to purchase, like an option agreement on the house. Is that kind of what's That's happening? Completely correct. Yeah. So we, we do limit by price point. We have to set within a certain price point because I can't have someone come to me with like a $5 million house. It just well, I need I mean, up a lot of money. I might be, maybe I'm in the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe at some point in time when we have a fund dedicated to that, but otherwise it makes it too hard. We go through money too quickly. So they come, they, they go find the house. There are price point ranges and we do require to be move-in ready. We don't want you buying. This isn't a rehab program. This is not going to get a fixer up or, um, and we'll flag that we actually, we ingest all homes listed for sale in the MLS and we actually flag where we think the home might not be a good fit. So it'll be like, hmm, there's one photo and it says investor special sale as is yellow flag. That's probably not a good divvy home. We're giving you a heads up because we don't want to surprise any of our, our customers. But I remember you want to hear a funny story, Mike, when we first found a divvy, I had no rules like in place. This was like very early on, like 2018. I didn't have as many rules. I just said, we buy within this price point. And someone brought to me, I kid you not, a castle. And they were like, will you do this with this castle? And I remember being like, I don't really have a rule around this. We should really start setting some rules as to the type. And I was trying to explain and the customer was just like, but you don't say that you can't buy castles on your website. And I was like, you're right. We don't, we don't have that rule. I mean, we didn't end up buying the house for him, but it reminded me of this whole thing where, you know, we try to just, we try to get our customers to essentially buy homes that we know will generally appreciate. Do not buy the million dollar home when the average price point in the market is a $250,000 home. That home, that's a tough investment and a tough bet to make, right? Buying a fixer upper home, it always seems like a good idea. And then when you're having to live in a house without half your lease, not such a good idea, right? And so we try to just push our customers towards what I call like, a pretty standard uh, starter home. Sometimes it depends, three, four bedrooms, two, three bathrooms, 2,500 to 3,500 3, square feet. Being like, you know, anywhere from sort of 15 minutes to an hour and a half from, from core downtown and maybe an hour from core downtown, depending on the city. Um, and those are roughly the houses that we, we, we try to help push our customers towards. But That's pretty open. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So it's, it's pretty... Um... It's a similar buy box to the other to investor range where they they want to have that uh, price range. It's a it's well, uh, I will say the the core difference though with other investors is they'll go out and they'll buy homes, and there's this um, intangible of needing homes that are very specific to you that becomes really tough for a customer with a single family rental portfolio, right? Which is I need a house down the street from my mom because she babysits my kids, <laughs> right? That is a very specific requirement that doesn't work that well for single family rental portfolios because they're buying based off of, oh, our, you know, our acquisitions team, it says it's one mile within a Starbucks. And therefore, I mean, I'm sorry, but no one buys a house because it's one mile within a Starbucks. Everyone buys it because it's close to a school or their family or their job or some other thing. So yeah. it, it's a similar buying profile, but I will say, that because we reverse the process, we start the customer, not the asset, that it actually results in slightly different homes actually being purchased. That's great, and that might be interestingly different um, competition for the buyers in a you know a, a notoriously uh, competitive price point in, in a bunch of those markets. Uh, that that might give them some flexibility. That's nice to hear. Um, I, I want to go back to you. You had a, you you said that you um, you you have a a uh, rough average plan for a three to four percent appreciation on on the homes, and then so in big booming up markets, uh, the the if I'm a Divi customer and, and I say I want to buy it now, and I can get a mortgage and I and I buy it, uh, mm -hmm. I buy it for the predetermined price, and I get the upside Everybody right is, away. That's yeah, terrific. Locked in ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. you want to get visibility, like. 
I also think that it's kind of crazy that we live in a world where like landlords can be like, hey, surprise, I just raised your rent by 20%. And I'm like, what? Someone, so like, I, we don't want to be like that. We want, we lay out for three years, here's your rent. You know this all before you can get into the arrangement with us. Like bef- before we even sign anything, I call it a, uh, we call it the octopus proposal now is like the technical term, but I used to call it the baby agreement, which is, hey, here are the bullet points of just like, FYI, you should know this before you like even get even close to signing a real contract. Our legal team did not love that at first. They're like, you know, you can't send customer bullet points summaries of a legal contract. I'm like, but we need to, this is like, I want it to be, I want it to be understandable. But yeah, we right. provide that all. Great. That's great. Okay. So, so tell me about your, your target. Who, who is taking advantage of this? Is it like, you know, 35 year old millennials? Is there like some other thing? What do you, what do you know about your customer? Uh, late thirties, early forties in terms of age, uh, largest, uh, segment are healthcare workers, um, transportation workers, uh, folks in education, um, they're generally about a hundred thousand dollars of household income. In general, fifty-one percent are um, non-W two only sal- uh, income, meaning that they they maybe have W two, but they'll also have some ten ninety nine income, or they'll have ten ninety nine plus child support. So it's various income sources. A lot of self employed. I think what else I can give you? Average FICO is actually almost six fifty. Okay, that's really interesting. the The ten ninety nine uh, stuff is really interesting because what I, it sounds like you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like uh, you're saying that like we can qualify a good renter here, and but the mortgage people are going to run you through the ringer, and it's going to be really hard. Is that is that what you're finding? Yeah. Well, I think one. Good luck going through mortgage applications are a little bit of a if anyone's gone through it, they never want to go through. There's a few things you never want to do again in your life. Probably mortgage applications lend them. One more easier was simpler. And I think we're just more innovative in how we we actually can underwrite individuals, right? So if you have multiple income streams, you're a more complex um, self-employed underwriting case, we're more equipped to be able to handle that. I think look, mortgage underwriting was meant for its first use case was actually post um, post World War II when when soldiers were coming back, they were settling down and having a family. Man and woman settle down and they stay in a house for the next 20 years. Uh, they, you know, steady income stream, W-2 job. That is what a mortgage is made for. Anything outside of that demographic, that social profile, as well as that income profile, mortgages were not really set up very well. Yeah, well, and and I think one of the reasons people choose to rent is for the the mobility of it, the the ease of in and out. Do you mm-hmm. does does Divi preserve that? Like, or now am I thinking about? Well, I got my like. Yeah. How, how does it? Do I get my advantages of staying as a renter? Yeah, you can. Well, you actually have better advantages in that you can leave any point on Divi's platform with sixty days notice. Period. And we'll cash you out less the two percent surrender fee. That's two percent of the initial purchase price because we now we now need to sell the house and we need to pay brokers and commissions and all sorts of stuff. And so, um, so we charge that fee. But otherwise, you can leave. Uh, we're probably the only landlord who, and my CEO is going to hate me for saying this, but like, you know, we don't make you stay in the house to the end of the rental contract. Just give us sixty days notice, and we understand life happens. Most of the folks who are getting into Divi are getting in with the mindset of I want to be here for a while. Right. If you have to leave, it's not because you want to. It's because like life happens, and so we we try to just be really thoughtful around that. Yeah. Okay. So I have some flexibility, um, and then you don't ever if the if the owner renter leaves, you don't ever keep that property and uh, and uh, put another renter in there, do you? We we sometimes we do a re divvy, so we'll we'll list it out. If you go on our homes, they're listed as like move in ready. Those are ones where they've come back to another customer, and we're offering them as another divvy property. Okay, so the you you get the deal, but but there's no transaction costs in there for you. You 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 keep it there. That's cool. Exactly. Well, I like yeah. that. That that sounds like a that sounds like a neat a neat option of uh, offshoot of having it there. Um, I mean, I'd love to in the future. You can even see an ecosystem in a world where. Divi has a large enough portfolio of homes where you can move between these a little bit more easily. Now we don't have that today. We're not, we're not probably at big enough scale to do that, but that's something that I think is interesting. is like being able to roll your equity credit. So like I'm starting off in a starter home. I've been here for five years. I've had two kids. I'm ready to move up to my next home. Can you actually roll my equity in this property to my next home? 
Um, and can you make that really seamless and easy for me? I think that that's things that in the future, Debbie will be able to offer. That will be amazing. Can you, can you share about how much scale you have now? You've raised a ton of money. So how many, how, like how many people do, are in Divi's now? Yes. Uh, so we don't, I don't th know what we've publicly released, uh, but I think that we, we have said we have thousands of, of families in our, our Divi properties. Um, so that's definitely a number that we, we put out there. And I think we've announced some of our, our capital raises. So you can probably add all those up and kind of figure out about how much scale we've had. But I will say we are in thousands, um, which is quite a bit larger than, it's, it's, than I'd say most of the other folks out there doing this. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's like it's real impact. You've, you've made some real impact there. Okay. You know, one of the things I like to um, ask my guests about is, uh, you know, you have a particular perspective on the market and on, you know, homes that people are buying and demand and, and some of the 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 um you know the interesting I like the 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 niche uh, your customer niche with the healthcare and the education workers hundred k uh, income is uh, like those are uh, traditionally underserved home buyers right those are like the people who are priced out more so you have a perspective on the market um, are there things uh, from that perspective that uh, trends or things that like our our listeners should know or like that the headlines are getting wrong that you go like, like, this is not the case. Like this is a different world than, than what we keep reading about. Do you have different perspectives on things like that? I'm not sure if I'd say that they're different. I'd say each market, first of all, is very uh, idiosyncratic. Like if you ask me how each market is doing Phoenix, I think is down like 5% year over year in terms of single family existing home sale price. Uh, you have someone like Cleveland that's up roughly a similar amount, but in the positive direction. So first and foremost, each market is very specific and you have to know that local market as to what is going on within it. In terms of within the market, I always find that the best appreciating part of the the price band in there is go to whatever the average uh, median home price is in that area and go down 10%. That to me is the area of market that you'll see and we've consistently seen has appreciated the greatest amount over the last five years or so. And so that's kind of a nice sweet spot to be in because one, everyone, um, if you're at the medium price point, you know that there's like close, a lot of demand. And if you actually uh, price slightly below that, you know, you even for appreciation versus like going slightly higher and <laughs> pricing out a lot of demand. So that's like one other thing to just think about in the markets. Um, I don't know that I have anything else that I think is very counter like to, to, to norms. Um, I think the one, and this is fairly known for anyone who's in the industry is like, I thought it was going to be doomsday when like, when the Fed was increasing um, interest rates and transparently it hasn't been. Home prices are down from peak, which was in August of 2022, but overall they are flat to slightly up year on year. So I'd say overall the housing market has held up phenomenally well. Um, and I think that I, I don't see anything to suggest that we're going to have a massive fall from home prices. I think we're, we're not going to see the spike in appreciation that we had during 2021, but that was probably a once in a lifetime situation, right? I don't think that we're going to, have, that's not the norm and anchoring to that is probably the wrong answer. The norm is if you go back over the last hundred years, I used to, I say this all the time, I used to be an investor for a while and I had this amazing uh, guy who founded the fund and he used to be like, Historical averages tell the truth. Go back to what things have been. And if you go back and you take the historical rate of appreciation for a specific market, that's probably what you should expect going forward. Got it. Okay. So I, I think you're right, by the way, um, about the, there's nothing in the data that shows home prices are falling from here. In fact, a lot of the data is showing uh, generally home price appreciation across the country, especially at, by the time you get to the end of the year. You know, we we uh, almost all the markets are comparing favorably, including Phoenix. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's a couple of exceptions. San Francisco and Austin are are maybe the the few that aren't quite there yet. But but um, mm -hmm. uh, but in general, the data is pointing very positive and gets easier uh, as we go to to the end of the year. Um, so uh, I'm interested also in talking about. Prop tech, as the as it's called, the venture funded real estate related technology companies. We we've had a we had an explosion of prop tech companies over the the time the last decade. Um, you know, I when I started Altos Research seventeen years ago, 
I would, uh, uh, I, you know, talked to venture folks at the time and I never took out, outside capital, but, you know, there were only a handful of uh, venture investors that would do anything in real estate, only a handful. And, um, and that changed dramatically uh, in the last decade. So, um, so you were obviously part of that big, and now there's a big shakeout, right? A lot of those folks are not making it. So tell me uh, how are you making it through? Like, what's what's the latest for you guys? And 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 like, what's next for 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 all these you know venture funded real estate prop tech companies? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so let's start first with venture capital investing in prop tech. You're right. When I was raising in 2017, it was hard to get anyone to even take a meeting. They were like asset heavy, real estate. Like that's not technology and. It took a while to get them comfortable. And so it's really unfortunate that we're in a situation now where prop tech companies are going under because it's going to make it hard for all of us. Even those that have been successful are now going to struggle as a result of this. So, so one, I fully agree. We came up, we came a long way and it feels like we maybe skirted back a little bit. Um, I would say though, tides change. People, venture capital community can be fickle and the eye goes towards one thing that the entire community runs after, and um, that's kind of where everyone everyone goes towards. And it's a known thing in venture that uh, being right and non consensus does win. Being right and being consensus does win because you got to get follow on rounds of capital. Um, so I would say that I fully see what you have seen, and I think that that is um, something that does transparently make me a little bit nervous. Is is sentiment towards the industry? I'd say Divi. On the other hand, look, we've done phenomenally well. I think um, there's the old Warren Buffett quote kind of to what you said, which is like the tide goes out, you see some swimming naked, which uh, some we're kind of seeing that a little bit shake down in the industry where you're like, growth masks all things. Growth masks what your debt service coverage ratios are. It masks issues with your maintenance costs or operationally how you're handling things. And when growth stops, it really shows who has been investing in what they've actually been trying to build out, especially in real estate. I think Divi, look, I'm not saying we we're perfect. There were definitely things that we had to work on. Um, I can tell you, like, this is a hard business. There's a million things I have to operationalize, like everything down to like, you know, how we deal with HOAs, which if you want to talk about something that you never want to have to spend a good chunk of your life working on, that's probably it. And we, we had to figure it out. Right. And you work through those and the people who I think come out of the other side are a lot stronger. And I think that, that, you know, I believe in Divi. I believe in the mission. I wouldn't be here otherwise. And um, I think we've had things like everyone else that we had to work through, but I think we're going to come out of this um, tremendously stronger because of it. So that's probably what I could say there. Um, and I will say that maybe one other point that I think is important to make is venture capital um, understands when they're investing in a deep tech in like a deep technology, like AI, if you are the partner who is diligencing that investment, they will pull in someone who can actually read code, who can understand what is being built in, because they know that even if you have a great business model, someone actually has to understand the technology that is being built out. And if you don't, right, you can get into something that you're maybe unprepared for. Venture capitalists, I think, thought that they can understand real estate because they were like, oh, I don't know, home. I understand real estate and they probably should have brought in people on the debt and credit side who finance a lar these assets at a large scale. A perfect example is every creditor that I have here at Tibby has asked me for my home team. Every home we own, every payment made, every detail, and they analyze and pull that home tape apart and go row by row looking at every single house. Not one time has a venture investor asked me for that. And so my one piece of advice for venture investors are to invest in this space and be successful and to be smart in it. Do the same thing you would do with any other industry, which is pulling the experts to diligence it. And there are people who have been doing um, asset-backed investing for a very long time, and I'd probably pull them in to make sure that the companies you're ultimately investing in are the right ones. That's fascinating. So the venture folks don't ask for the, the asset, the detailed asset level analysis, the like, that's the business. Like that's where the magic is. Like, and they don't, that's really interesting. <laughs> it's really telling. Um, do Maybe you ever, now they will. Maybe we'll change the tide of the market, which I'm going to be biting my tongue for saying that because now I'm going to get like these, 
detailed diligence questions. Maybe that was dumb of me. But. In my in my vast poll with the venture industry, uh, my 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 vast venture capital audience will uh, be paying attention to that. <laughs> Um, and, and you'll get new questions next time. Uh, and careful what you ask for, by the way. <laughs> like, I know, exactly, that right? um, uh, so, so, so are there uh, models or even companies in the prop tech, the, the technology, real estate focused world? Are there ones that you are excited about that you go, that one's cool, uh, that one's got legs? And, and I'm thinking especially in this, like all the assumptions are different now, right? Than they were six years ago. And, and so in the, in the next future, there's no more soft bank. There's, you know, like, you know, like yeah, maybe the there ecosystem is, but, you know, has changed. Yeah. So, so are there, are there those that you are, um, that you're, in, that you're excited about or that even if they like, you know, bought a bunch of market share because they had soft bank capital, maybe they have another, maybe they bought enough and they're like, tell me what you're excited about. Um, so I'd say, when I look at a, a prop tech company the, or anything sort of in, in real estate world, commercial or residential, I look for a couple of characteristics. And I want you to laugh at these because recurring revenue and high margin. And the reason why I say that is this is no different than any other business. This is no different than a SaaS business. It's you find companies that cash flow, that cash flow absent the macro cycle, recurring revenue high margin. This isn't like rocket science, right? All businesses are the same. And if you look at um, a lot of the kind of very um, big names in prop tech that maybe have gone away, a lot of them are based off of transaction revenue, non-recurring low margin. And so I guess, you know, when I think about what I am excited about, I think very much from a business perspective, recurring revenue, high margin business is number one. Um, in terms of actual core technology that could like truly, truly change our market, um, I think that, you know, everyone wants to say that AI is going to, I think, change the world. And I fully agree that I think it will in 20 years from now. And I think in the interim, in the near term, a lot of the language learning or large language models that we have LLMs they are going to potentially impact the way customer support orgs or um, any sort of communication processes happen with customers. I don't think that that's a core technology that's going to fundamentally change the way we make decisions as at a as a company. Um, so I'd say that I don't think that that is. Um, I think that maybe the uh, weight that people are putting on that to actually impact companies is slightly different than what we're actually seeing in reality. Um, so that's kind of my take on AI. I'd say uh, blockchain um, or ways that we can store ledger systems and accountability could be interesting, but I've never seen it actually take off in a way that I thought, hey, this is such a competitive edge into how it is being implemented that it couldn't have been done any other way. So I guess that's a short way of saying I'm not super, I would say, bullish on this being an extreme time of innovation right now. I think that I see it. Maybe this isn't, this is a little bit too much of my, my realistic approach to the world, but I just see this as a time for the industry to get your ducks in a row, focus, focus on your foundation. And it's not a time of extreme flourishment in terms of innovation, or at least that's not what I'm really seeing. Well, I appreciate your your realistic <laughs> focus on the world. That, that's great, and and um, I think that that insight about you know the businesses that are um, recurring revenue focused rather than transaction count focused probably makes a lot of sense, and that we are probably aiming for a, a low transaction volume for the next several years at least as, as, uh, you know, we have a supply cap and we have, we have a, a restricted supply restricted market. Doesn't matter how much the demand is, there's just not that many homes for sale. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of companies that made, made a name for themselves in the past two years, capitalizing on a, on an economic and macro situation that was not the norm, but the exception. The zero interest rate phenomenon uh, companies. Yes. Okay. Um, and I think it's an interesting take on on AI. Um, the so so your your point is that like 
you could see innovation at the customer service level, um, but not in operationally finding things out. Uh, it, certainly, now the 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 LLMs haven't haven't lent themselves there yet. You haven't seen anything exciting there. Well, so look, I look, I can see little implementations here and there. Do I wish that I had a way that I could easily parse through a credit agreement with a lender and say, give me the core bullet points? Yes. If I can do that and I can synthesize it in a quicker manner, does that have any impact on my ability to be successful at, as a company? Nah, maybe Maybe not. a little scale. Now, but like you have like a handful, I mean, no one's operating. Even companies that have gone public, maybe you have 20 facilities, right? I, that's not, it's not giving you that much of an, an upside. Now there's, where it does give a slight upside is in customer communication. So taking phone calls, being able to synthesize them, following up with customers, creating uh, workflows that, that come out of that interaction on a call, that is super interesting. I don't think that these are things that um, can't be handled with humans today, but instead are things that as you scale and wanna save on the cost side, can help you do that, right? And they create more consistency around how it gets done. So we're definitely spending time thinking about that. I'm just not sure, excuse me, I'm not sure that I've seen anything to date that when I dig in, I'm like, wow, this is gonna fundamentally give me a competitive advantage in the market unlike anything I've ever seen, right? It gives me scalability, it removes cost, OPEX, it gives me more leverage in my business model. But I don't know if I feel like that's a competitive edge. No, don't get me wrong. I think OpenAI is probably once in a generation company. If yeah. I wasn't, and I say this to everyone out there, like if I wasn't founding Divi and building this, heck, go work there. Like go work as this is going to be a once in a generation company that's going to be worth $100, $200 billion one day. I, I do actually fully believe that. I think though the implications as to the companies that get built on top of that that I want to still take time to kind of understand the application and then how you take that application layer that's kind of on top of being built on top of open AI and how you actually build a defensible business. Terrific. Uh, I think that's an excellent synthesis of uh, the technology space. I appreciate it very much. And we don't even, I think, need to need to touch on the blockchain uh, conversation because it's sort of evaporated there. It's still out there a little bit, but but man, uh, sure, that seems like we haven't seen any uh, anything really compelling on that side. So though, let's switch. So um, uh, two, two sort of last questions. I can't believe it's been almost an hour already. Um, the... Um, uh, I'm interested in your view of the market. Like we measure the market and we are interested in leading indicators. Do you have any data that you have that gives you a, like a, uh, a, a special indicator of the market? Or do you have something that you like to look at that you say, this is what I'm going to um, pay attention to for the future to form your vision of the future of the market? Prices and supply and demand and all the things. Yeah, you mean the real estate market, not like the equities market. Yeah, like I think that, yeah, okay. the real estate market. Okay, okay got it. Uh, just making sure I'm like, well, yeah, Mike, I would probably start a hedge fund if I had really good data around what's going to happen in the equities market. Um, so uh, real estate market, I pay attention to everything. I look at every month um, supply on a metro level. I look at existing home sales. I look at mortgage rates, absorption, months, the exact inverse of it, just months of supply. Um, I follow all of it. I follow exactly what homes my competitors are buying because it's publicly available and I track all of it. Um, I think that when we were starting this kind of period of, of rate hikes, I said there were a couple things that I wanted to see. One, um, absorption or um, had to have bottomed um, and starting to increase. Um, which is the same thing as just saying months of inventory um, peak. Um, and so I wanted to see that. I wanted to see Fed fund rate uh, hikes were, were kind of at a plateau because I wanted to know this is, you know, this is the where interest rates are going to kind of pause at and I can actually take a breather and assess. And then I wanted to see um, cap rates widening by enough of margin to offset the increase in interest expenses. And those were the things that I was paying attention to. And I wanted to see that basically what percent of homes that are listed for sale 
would be able to hit a certain margin when you take cap rates and you subtract that interest rate. So cap rates, essentially, you're all in yield on a, on a house and interest rate, obviously, you have to pay interest on that house. When you subtract the two, you get what is my actual post interest? It's called funds from operation. What is the margin there? And I wanted to see that there was enough inventory that I could buy at that margin. And so those are kind of the three things that I really anchored my mind to. And I, I like to set up these frameworks early on because it holds you accountable then to go back every quarter and say, didn't we hit these? Like what actually happened? A lot of times I get them wrong. I will say that what I think is important at the beginning is not necessarily as important as what actually comes out. And I actually think that, that that is a beautiful life lesson learned, which is the ability to then change and alter and say, what did I miss? Why did I not see this other thing and instead I was focused on this? And I think the key thing that I kind of had a takeaway comment about, I write these all up as memos when I'm thinking through these decisions because I find it uh, helpful to actually truly hold myself accountable with a memo. We do it across all of Divi. It was actually something I used to do at my former employer, um, TPG, so we used to have to write memos for everything and I kind of stuck with it over time. Um, and one of the things that it said is available, capital readily available. <laughs> and I put this like flyaway comment and turns out that was probably the most important comment. Um, and I didn't actually buff it out enough to say equity capital markets, how open would they need to be? Who's going to be out there buying? Like, what is that going to look like? But um, I think that that is probably the linchpin thing is just that right now, equity capital is not readily available. Sources of capital. U.S. pension funds are dealing with denominator effect, and so they're not putting a lot of money to work. Sponsors are mostly sitting on the sidelines. And most people are having to go to um, sovereign wealth funds to essentially source capital. And so I think that that was something I maybe should have put more emphasis on. That was a good lesson for me in going back and will hone my thinking for the next rate cycle that I get to hopefully not live through. <laughs> I don't want to be around for the next one. I've one is enough in my my well, I guess two, three in my lifetime. That's but right. One more anyway, bubble. I swear lesson. I won't screw this one up. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, um, okay, so that's terrific. And so uh, let me ask you this about about you mentioned cap rates. So so in places like Phoenix, cap rates improved for about four months last year. And now they're, yeah. you know, prices are pretty. So how do you look at a place like Phoenix and, and like, you know, we had about, we, you know, we had four months of correction and then maybe it was six months and now it's like, you know, the, the momentum is switched back the other way. What do you look at? Like, how does the future look in a place like that? Yeah. So for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with what we're talking about, we look at rent, and if you take rent and you divide it by the purchase price, you'll get a rent yield, right? How much rent am I making for the dollars I had to invest? And then you subtract maintenance, taxes, insurance, HOA fees, vacancy adjustments, bad debt for, for rent not collected, and you get to essentially like a, a true measure of profit per home, and you divide that by home price, and you get to what the yield is on that profit. Um, and you hope that that's more than your cost of interest, because then you have to pay interest after that. And so if you make, for example, in the market, a 5% cap rate and interest rates are 6%, well, guess what? You're probably not going to, you're not going to buy that house. That's a negative, right? You don't want to be in that position. And so we're constantly looking at this spread in between interest rates and cap rates to kind of say, are we going to be making money or not? And to impact this, you're not really moving your cost around. Costs don't move very much in real estate because maintenance is pretty much known for a home and taxes the government sets for you and insurance, it's pretty much set. And so the only things that really move these numbers are you can get more rent, you can pay less for a home, so that rent dollar gets you a better return, or you pay less in, in interest expense or take less leverage, but I'm just saying like total interest cost. Those are our three options. Um, and so if you want investors to kind of come back into the market and make this all work, one of those three things has to happen. I don't think home prices are going down, so er, that one's gone. And so then you're like, okay, well, rent, rent can go up, or interest rates have to come down. And those are kind of the catalyzing events. Yeah. You have a take on which one's going? I think we're all gonna be hanging out here for about another 12 months until uh, interest rates start to come down. Although I will say that I think uh, rents are gonna get pushed up for consumers. I mean, that's okay. naturally- what Maybe, so maybe a little of both. Or at least somewhere in the middle is usually the right answer. It's a nice way to hedge your answer too, so you don't get anything wrong. That's right. That's right. Sometime in the future, rents will be up and rates will probably be down. That does uh, you'll win you that. Go. That's 
That's good advice, right? That's what the people come here to hear. Just that, yeah, no, I, I think that r- rents will be going up uh, probably sooner than interest rates will be going down. So I'd probably okay. say I think rents are going to continue to tick up the rest of the year. Interest rates, I think we've got until the first half of next year before Jerome maybe starts taking them down. That will be, uh, you know, fingers crossed. As I said, measure, we measure every home for sale in the country every week and all the prices and all the rentals, but I don't have any idea where mortgage rates are going. Like that's, that's beyond my pay grade. Um, mm-hmm. so, uh, so, okay. Well, look, it's, it's been really terrific. I love the story of Divi. I love the, the vision and, and what, uh, you're accomplishing there. And, and really, you know, we have an affordability challenge. And so I'm, always interested in the models and the people that are tackling affordability uh, for homeowners in the U.S. And it's uh, so I appreciate that very much and, and appreciate your time. Um, where where should people go find you and or about you and Divi? And should they follow you on social media and stuff? What, what's where do you communicate? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, they can find Divi at DiviHomes.com or just Divi.com, D-I-V-V-Y. Um, they can tweet at us at Divi Homes. They can tweet at me at Adina Hafitz. Uh, I am not the best on social media. So if you send me a message on Twitter or LinkedIn, I, I will get back to you, but I am not um, as hip as I should be. And I'm not on like TikTok and all of those things. Um, but if you if you message at Divi Homes on Twitter, our social media team are 10x better than I am, and they'll probably get back to you sooner, but you can also message me. Terrific. I really appreciate that. Uh, Adina Hafetz, thank you so much for your time. It's really insightful. Um, uh, good luck on the journey with Divi and uh, in this next era of, of the whole industry. Thank you for your time. Take care. All right, everybody. That's the Top of Mind podcast. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please leave a review and some stars for us so other people can find the show. Uh, We'll be back more next week. See you. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate leaving a nice review on your favorite podcast app. That helps other people find us as well. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. See you soon.